I recall once during an October thunderstorm down south that the power got knocked out. So I decided to sit up, listen to the storm rage outside, and read a bit. So I went to the shelf and pulled off the first volume of the Babylonian Talmud, Ma'asechet Berachot. Opening it up to Daf 6a, I was reading along, and though I had studied this section before, something about it gave me the chills. Perhaps it was the storm outside, or the autumn air beginning to break through the southern heat, or just being alone in a big, dark, old house. But as I studied along, I came to this section that read, In another Baraisa, it's taught that Abba Benjamin says, quote, If the eye were given permission to see, no creature would be able to withstand the abundance and ubiquity of the demons, and continue to live unaffected by them. And further down, the Talmud quotes Rabbi Abaya, who says, The demons are more numerous than we are, and they stand over us like mounds of earth surrounding a pit. And finally, Rav Kuna said, Each and every one of us has a thousand demons to his left, and 10,000 demons to his right. This is interesting because the left is typically associated with evil, but here there are fewer demons on the left than there are on the right. And though the Talmud says that God protects us from such creatures, there's no denying that the Talmud imagines our world to be a pandemonium. This term was invented by John Milton in Paradise Lost to describe the very capital of hell itself. We normally take the word to mean something like chaos, but the original Greek reveals that it literally means full of demons. In the imagination of the rabbis, reality itself is infested in every nook and every cranny with demons. The idea, whether I believe it or not, that just beyond the reach of the candle that I was reading with, there lurks untold thousands of malevolent entities is truly an uncanny idea. No text in the history of demonology has better attempted to catalog, describe, and perhaps most important of all, conjure and control this pandemonium than the mysteriously named Lamegaton, more commonly known as the Lesser Key of Solomon. In this episode of Esoterica, we're going to explore the early history of the role of Solomon in controlling demons, the genealogy of demons, and their hierarchies, along with the composition and construction of this most famous, or should I say infamous, book of black magic. This episode is also special because it's a collaboration with my colleague and fellow academic researcher of all things esoteric, Angela Puka, over at her channel, Angela's Symposium. Angela specializes in the academic study of magic and magic practicing religions and traditions, and comes from a scholarly background in philosophy. She now focuses on contemporary esoteric and occult practices. Angela's going to pick up where I leave off and cover the important history of this text as it enters the occult canon in the late 19th century. So make sure to check out Angela's Symposium for the continuation of this episode, and make sure to subscribe for her fascinating content. So let's turn to the early history of Solomonic magic and to the Lesser Key of Solomon itself. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. It is perhaps unsurprising that Solomon, the famed Israelite monarch, would become the most celebrated magus of occult wisdom in the European theater. While Solomon is famous for being, quote, wiser than the men of the East and of Egypt, specifically his knowledge of botany is mentioned, linking him already with a kind of spigeric wisdom often associated with poisons and magic. Further, he's credited with the construction of the first temple in Jerusalem for the Israelite god, and allegedly the gate complexes that survive in the area are testimony to his centralized and well-run kingdom. Despite this apparent act of piety, the text also reveals a character who is willing to seek wisdom and pleasure well beyond orthodox bounds. The Hebrew Bible chides his marriage to Nama the Ammonite, who in fact becomes a demon in later Zoharic literature, and the importation of foreign worship and the mysterious mention of the Queen of Sheba have produced an entire lore unto itself. Here, Solomon is something of a transgressive figure, a kind of Israelite Faust, whose pleasure and wisdom leave him dejected and reeling if we were to take Kohelet or Ecclesiastes to be in his voice. The transgressive wisdom and liminal character of Solomon make him the best candidate to wield the supernatural powers that stretch beyond the common bounds of good and evil. Or Jew or Gentile. As early as the philosopher Aristobulus, Solomon is described as, quote, one of his predecessors in the development of general philosophical wisdom, and by the turn of the Common Era, the apocryphal wisdom of Solomon describes the Israelite king thus, for it is he that gave me unerring wisdom of what exists, to know the structure of the world and the activity of the elements, the beginning and the middle and the end of times, the alternation of the solstices and the changes of the seasons, the cycles of the years and the constellations of the stars, the natures of the animals and the tempers of wild beasts, the power of spirits and the reasoning of men. 
the variety of plants and the virtue of roots, I have learned both what is secret and what is manifest. For wisdom, the fashioner of all things, taught me. Here we have the universal knowledge of Solomon enumerated beyond the botanical wisdom of the Book of Kings into a full panoply of cosmological, astrological, biological, and physical reality of both things seen and unseen. Here, Solomon's wisdom is said to contain both exoteric and esoteric wisdom, befitting an Alexandrian philosopher of this period. As I've noted in another episode, many philosophers of this time, such as Pythagoras, Democritus, Empedocles, and others, were seen not only possessing worldly philosophical wisdom, but also esoteric secrets and magical powers. Indeed, there are several spells attributed to just these philosophers in the Greek magical papyri of the early common era. This ability of Solomon to control spirits, or daimones, is not unique to the Alexandrian context. At Qumran, in the Judean wilderness, a very fragmented psalm of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 11Q11, and actually mentions, although in a very fragmentary form, the powers that Solomon allegedly had over demons. You can see in this fragment that Solomon is wielding the power of the divine name in order to control and bind demons. This nearly 2,000-year-old psalm still captures the fundamental logic behind much of Solomonic magic, the ability to wield divine names in the effort to control demons in order to force those demons to do your will. So it seems quite clear that something like this idea has existed both in the Greek and in the strictly Jewish context for over two millennia. And one begins to see just how deep and how far back this idea of Solomonic power over demons goes. In the first century of the Common Era, the Jewish Roman historian Josephus extended this power over demons, writing in his famous book, The Antiquities of the Jews. This fascinating story, here linking Solomon with the ability to exorcise demons, is very important in the history of Solomonic magic. Here we have an early mention of a Solomonic ring with power over demons, a feature that will appear over and over again in magical lore. Indeed, in the first centuries of the Common Era, the trope of Solomonic control over demons, specifically in the service of the construction of the temple, would appear in numerous texts from the Gnostic texts of the Nag Hammadi Library, to the Greek Magical Papyri, to the Ginza scriptures of the Mandeans, but most importantly in both the Babylonian Talmud and in the Testament of Solomon. These two texts provide two different accounts of Solomon's demonic employ for the construction of the temple. In the Talmudic story, it can be found in Tractate Gittin 68a and following, Solomon is faced there with a conundrum within Jewish law. The altar, and by extension the temple itself, must be constructed of unhewn stone. That is to say, stone not worked by iron tools. But how is it possible to construct such a huge structure as a temple with unworked stone? Well, the answer, of course, is a magical worm or some kind of very small creature called the Shamir which is able to cut stone without the use of iron tools. Well, the natural question is, how does one obtain the Shamir? Well, and again, this should all be very obvious. You capture male and female demons, and after some period of torturing them, they confess to you that the person who knows where the Shamir is, is the arc demon Asmodeus. From there, it's pretty easy. You just go get the demon Asmodeus drunk, you chain him up with magical chains with the divine name on them, and then you drag him back to Jerusalem. Of course, in the text itself, there's a long detour. It takes them a while to get back to Jerusalem and all kinds of funny things happen. The story is really worth reading on its own. There, we find out that while Asmodeus does in fact know where the Shamir is, the Shamir lives on a distant mountain protected by a special bird guardian. This magical bird is called the Duchifat. Uh, there's a pun here in Aramaic that I'll put on the screen. But the Duchifat has made an oath to protect the Shamir. Well, eventually the bird is tricked and sadly actually kills itself in shame for having lost the Shamir. The Shamir is eventually taken back to Jerusalem and the project of beginning to build the temple is overseen by both Asmodeus the demon and King Solomon. Eventually in the story Solomon is tricked by Asmodeus into removing his chains and eventually Asmodeus actually eats Solomon's magical ring and then punches him into the air for several hundred miles. At that point the demon Asmodeus actually takes over the throne of Israel, perhaps shape-shifting into Solomon, it's not really clear. And at that point either Solomon retakes the throne from Asmodeus or doesn't. Surprise, surprise, the rabbis can't really agree on exactly what happens. But at any rate, we have this very elaborate story about this relationship between Solomon, the demon Asmodeus, and the construction of the temple using this magical creature or worm called the Shamir. For some reason, the story has always reminded me of kind of a Marvel superhero movie with a Solomon versus Asmodeus, with Solomon having magical powers and magical rings, and, and Asmodeus and Solomon getting into some kind of magical duel high into the air above Jerusalem just always struck me as one of the big fight scenes from like something like a Marvel movie or something. Maybe someone should make that movie. Maybe Esoterica could write the script. Marvel presents Solomon versus Asmodeus. Hmm. At any rate, action movies aside, it's typically thought that the Testament of Solomon is going to have a greater impact on the development of Solomonic magic, especially in the Christian context, 
than the Talmudic story found in the Babylonian Talmud. The Apocryphal Testament of Solomon is typically thought to be composed in its current form in the early Middle Ages, but probably contains lore reaching all the way back to the late Classical period and perhaps even to the turn of the Common Era. And it is this text that will prove most influential on the development of Solomonic magic in the Christian context. In this very complicated narrative, a young man is being tortured by a demon named Ornias, and Solomon prays to the Archangel Michael for a solution. Solomon is then gifted a magical ring which allows him to bind both Ornias and the prince of the demons, Beelzebub. Solomon then uses the bound Beelzebub in the construction of the temple. Further, Solomon is then given a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of all demons, including their astrological origins, along with the various powers they're said to have and how those powers can be bound for use by Solomon. Such a catalog of angelic slash demonic powers can be traced all the way back to the 3rd century BCE Book of Enoch, where we learn of the corrupting role of the various fallen angels in human affairs. Solomon is also allowed to interrogate the various planetary demons as well. This is probably an echo of the Gnostic worldview in which the planets are said to be sort of demonic archons which rule over the physical world, along with their various powers and their respective angelic adversaries. This includes a whole host of other astral demons, including the famed demoness Lilith, here going under the name Obizut. Here we learn of the various demons of the deacons of the zodiac, their astral origins, and how to bind them. We are told that Solomon binds many, if not all, of these demons and sets them all to work in the construction of the temple. Some of them even doing menial tasks like carrying water. However, the large cornerstone of the temple can't be set in place by any of these demons. It turns out that there's a thwarting angel guarding the cornerstone. It turns out that this angel is in fact no angel at all, but a prefigurement of Jesus himself. Here, a Christian interpolation onto an otherwise Jewish text. Despite the protestations of this angel slash prefigurement of Christ, the cornerstone is eventually set into place by the demon of the air and the demon of the Red Sea. The testament ends with Solomon turning toward foreign gods out of an intense love and then lamenting to the reader of his many mistakes. And one can see here a kind of pre-Faustian trope operating in the story here of the Testament of Solomon. While the testament does provide the who, what, where, and why about the nature, power, and binding of demons in the cosmos, it's very important to realize that this is not itself a magical text. It does not provide the reader with the how. There's no practical advice for how to actually bind demons in this text. Despite the text operating a bit like a demonic encyclopedia, we simply do not learn from the Testament of Solomon how Solomon did the magical things described there, and thereby we can't strictly speaking call this text a book of magic. It's a book about magic, surely, but there is no practical advice here. Even at this early point in history, we do however see in two different types of literature the early emergence of Solomonic magic. We can see Solomonic magic beginning to emerge both in the Greek magical papyri, but also in an early book of Jewish magic called the Sefer HaRazim. In the Greek magical papyri, we're given two different spells invoking the name of Solomon. One famously called the Solomonic Collapse, which seems to induce a kind of trance state or perhaps a kind of ecstatic seizure. This can be found in PGM 4, 850 through 929. And further, at PGM 4, 3006 through 86, we're given a Solomonic seal to be used in exorcisms. As early as the Greek magical papyri, we're given a Solomonic seal that binds the power of demons. This idea has taken very early on in the history and development of Western magic. Further, the idea that Solomon used magical powers to bind and control demons is also to be found in the Sefer HaRazim, or the Book of Secrets, an early book of Jewish magic, perhaps from the third or fourth centuries of the Common Era, preserved in the Cairo Geniza. I've made separate videos on both the Greek magical papyri and the Sefer HaRazim here at Esoterica, so feel free to check those out if you're interested. The concept of Solomon as a conjurer or wielder of magic clearly also survived into the Islamic context. In Ibn al-Nadim's monumental encyclopedia, the Fihrist, Solomon is mentioned as having power over demons, and some of these demons are even enumerated by Ibn Nadim. This same trope also occurs, famously, in the Arabian Nights tales. And it appears at some point in the Byzantine context that the leap is made from actually describing Solomon as a conjurer to describing the modes of conjurations themselves. It's not exactly clear when this transition happens, and this is still a major area of research, but by at least the 15th century, texts describing Solomonic magic began to appear in Greek, and it is probably through this conduit, among others, that this concept of Solomonic magic will enter into Western Europe. Though, in the Western European context, by at least the High Middle Ages, the Ars Notoria is already linked with Solomon. Though it is a semi-licit magical text and typically free of demonic invocation, it does facilitate the rapid magical understanding of the liberal arts and will eventually become associated with the Lesser Key of Solomon. By the High Middle Ages, Albertus Magnus, the teacher of Thomas Aquinas, already mentions about five different books of necromancy floating around Europe that will eventually become associated also with the Lesser Key of Solomon. 
Over the next few centuries, there's a steady stream of texts associated with Solomon mentioned in lists of condemned books, transcripts of interrogations, prohibited indexes, various condemnations, and so on. Though it should be pointed out here that while we have texts that have come down to us in the name of Solomonic magic, we can never be sure that those texts mentioned in these medieval lists and the texts that have come down to us are in fact the same texts. It's not uncommon for the titles and the actual text of medieval books to vary significantly from manuscript to manuscript. So for instance, we don't know if a text mentioned by Albertus Magnus or Cornelius Agrippa are in fact the same texts that have come down to us. Medieval texts simply aren't stable in the same way that modern books are. Regardless, by the time of the Renaissance, the Key of Solomon had become the key book of black magic in the Western European context for reasons that are still somewhat unclear. This status would persist through the early modern period and the rise of occult societies in the 19th and 20th centuries. Indeed, the Solomonic magical tradition has reached pop culture, appearing in art, film, and even video games. I think I even saw someone with a Goetia tattoo the other day. I think you should be careful tattooing demonic sigils on your body, but your mileage may vary. It's here that I want to pass over the key of Solomon proper. I want to spend an entire episode just on that text. And don't worry, I'll be doing a separate video just on that text alone. Although, the first part of this episode also acts as an introduction for that text as well. And I want to turn my attention to the more influential Lesser Key of Solomon, sometimes referred to as the Lamegaton. The Lamegaton Colavicula Solomonis, often referred to as the Lesser Key of Solomon, is an English-language anthological book of magic anonymously composed sometime in the mid-17th century. Even the name of the text is somewhat mysterious. While it's often referred to as the Lesser of Key of Solomon, in most manuscripts, it's actually referred to as the Little Key of Solomon. And the name attached to it, Le Megaton, is anything other than clear. Perhaps it's a corrupt Greek word. Although the original author claims that the text was originally in Hebrew, no Hebrew editions of it survive, but this word certainly doesn't seem like a Hebrew or Aramaic word to me. In fact, as far as we can tell, the word actually occurs first in the Ars Notoria, and is used as a reference to a Solomonic text of, quote, spiritual and secret experimentations. It seems as if the writer or the compiler of the Lesser Key of Solomon latched onto the idea from the Ars Notoria and attached this word Le Megaton to their anthological text. It's rather unclear if the Le Megaton mentioned in the Ars Notoria was in fact an actual historical text. Needless to say, the term remains mysterious. The Lesser Key of Solomon is, as I mentioned a moment ago, an anthological text, which is pretty typical for many medieval book. It's not uncommon to find several different texts with a common theme bound together in one volume. In this case, the Lesser Key of Solomon typically deals with the invocation and binding power over demons and other kinds of spirits, which also may explain why the Ars Notoria sometimes appears in manuscripts and sometimes doesn't. It just doesn't fit this common theme, really. In its maximal form, the Lesser Key of Solomon is composed of five independent texts, which in many senses don't relate to each other systematically. In fact, the logic of one text seems to be mutually exclusive with the logic of another. So it's important to note that the Lesser Key of Solomon is not some grand unified theory of magic or conjuration. Rather, it's an anthology of texts bound together around a common theme. The maximal edition of the Lesser Key of Solomon would include five different texts. The Ars Goetia, the Ars Theurgia Goetia, the Ars Paulina, the Ars Amadel, and with the Ars Notoria appearing in some manuscripts. The composite text as we have it probably dates to the mid-17th century, probably composed somewhere in England, although it certainly includes material that reaches back centuries prior. The most famous of these texts is the Ars Goetia, deriving from the Greek goes, which means sorcerer, a word typically associated with malevolent magic, which may reach back to a word meaning something like to groan or to howl or to wail. The text itself is a catalog enumerating some 72 demons, their appearance, their rank, their seals, their magical function, along with a complex series of conjurations for invoking them, including to when they're resistant to the magus or simply going about some other demonic duty. The list of demons contains some that are very well known, such as Asmodeus, Astaroth, Baal, Belial, and even Phoenix for some reason, along with a myriad of others that are otherwise unknown or obscure. I've always appreciated that the 31st demon, Foras, can teach you, among other things, ethics. Because there's just something hilarious about the idea of learning ethics from, of all things, a demon. The various demonic seals are typical of the period, and this symbolism reaches all the way back to the Greek magical papyri. Although it seems like most of these magical sigils are emerging from a French magical tradition, which is now otherwise obscure. I've made a separate video on the history of some of these sigils and how they developed from the Greek period on. If you're curious about that, take a look at the card above. As we've seen, such demonic inventories stretch back millennia, at least as far back as the Book of Enoch. 
but the list enumerated in the Goetia seems to have somewhat ironic origins. While the list probably reaches back into the High Middle Ages, there's good reason to believe that Trithemius had access to such a list, and similar demons also occur in the 15th century Munich Necromancer's Manual. The immediate source of this list seems to be Johann Weyer's 1583 edition of the Preistidigitis Daemonum, itself probably reliant actually on a French manuscript, that he calls the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum, or the False Monarchy of the Demons as they are reproduced in Reginald Scott's famous The Discovery of Witchcraft in 1584. It is his 1584 text upon which the Goetia seems more directly reliant. The irony of course here is that both Weyer and Scott's texts are meant to actually diminish belief in the world of the demons, the world of the supernatural, and the world of witchcraft specifically. So it's somewhat hilarious that texts meant precisely to diminish belief in demons have become the chief mechanism by which practitioners actually seek out to invoke and bind them. I suspect that the popularity of the Ars Goetia are actually causing Vire and Scott to roll in their graves. I think the other specter looming large in this whole question has to be John Milton's epic Puritan masterpiece Paradise Lost. There we also have a similar catalog of demons and demonic forces, although it doesn't seem that the writer of the Ars Goetia or the Lesser Key of Solomon as a text have been influenced by John Milton. However, it's not hard to imagine mid-17th century England with all its violence as being depicted as an area rife with demonic power. The conjuration found in the Goetia is heavily lifted from the exorcism literature of the Middle Ages, and especially relies on Pseudo-Albano's Heptameron. Here we have what will become all the classical devices of black magic. Magic circles with Hebrew names, a triangle for binding the spirits, Solomonic seals and a brazen vessel surrounded with a Hebrew incantation to bind the power of the spirits along with a complex set of conjurations, astrological timing, incense, and ritual entire, including swords and even lion skin. The genius of the Goetia is not in its originality per se, but in the ability to synthesize previous material into a truly theatrical ritual process that captivates the mind, the senses, and the emotions of the original practitioner. It's unsurprising on this account that this text has gone on to become the standard textbook for the occult. It is also the genius of the Goetia that overshadows the other texts in the Lesser Key of Solomon. The second book of the Lesser Key, the Ars Theurgia Goetia, contains a separate system of invocation regarding spirits. In this text, we're dealing with both good and bad spirits, which are principally associated with the points of the compass, along with some wandering spirits bringing the grand total in the second book to 31. This text and the third, the Ars Paulina, derive principally from the stenographia of Trithemius Recall Trithemius is the teacher of Cornelius Agrippa, the author of the three books on occult philosophy. The Ars Paulina, named in reference to the Apostle Paul's ascent to the third heaven described in 2 Corinthians, is interesting because of its astrological focus on good spirits, the conjuration of the quote holy guardian angel which echoes the magic of the complex Abramelin ritual, itself has a huge impact on the development of 20th century occultism, the absolute profusion of spirits in this text, the mention of an exact date, March 10th of 1641, and what may be one of the earliest mentions of firearms in a magical text. We're told that a certain conjuration can protect the user from quote any firearms, guns, or the like. Who needs AR-500 plate armor when you have spirits, right? The fourth text of the Lesser Key is also the shortest. The Almadel seems to be a corruption perhaps of an Arabic name or word, and describes the process for creating a wax sigil for the invocation of various spirits. This magic may reach back all the way to Judeo-Arabic magic, and contemporaneous versions of such devices occur in at least one Jewish magical manuscript. While brief, this text is also very important for the history of scrying, and likely had an impact on the magical furniture used by Dr. John Dee and Edward Kelly and their very famous conversations with angels. The key items here being the wax sigils revealed to Dee and Kelly during the course of the spirit conversations and still preserved in the British Museum to this day. The final text of the Lesser Key of Solomon is inconsistently found in the various manuscripts which have survived. This is the famed Ars Notorio, which invokes angels in order to gain rapid access and knowledge of the liberal arts, such as grammar, rhetoric, logic, geometry, arithmetic, music, and astronomy. The Ars Notoria is otherwise well known, and manuscripts of this text date back to at least the 13th century, and is famous for its use of very complex notai, which are said to compress huge amounts of information into single complex sigils. This text is so complex and famous that I'll be doing a separate episode on it alone at some point in the future, so stay tuned for that. Although I will say, as someone who studied philosophical logic, it would be very convenient to have a magical sigil to learn possible world semantics. In some sense, what makes the Lesser Key of Solomon so influential is that rather than being a singular book of magic, it is something like a micro-magical library. 
which collects a wide range of magical texts and practices, from demonic magic to angelic magic to scrying to astral theory and just general wisdom acquisition into one very robust, if not terribly systematic text. What I think makes the Lesser Key of Solomon so influential is not it as a systematic text of magical theory and practice, but rather as a robust and diverse library that the magical practitioner can call upon in order to suit that practitioner's needs and interests. After the Lesser Key's composition sometime in the mid-17th century, the text seemed to have been copied on several occasions, which indicates its popularity, and several incongruent manuscripts of various levels of corruption have survived. The text was then passed into the hands of what I would call proto-occultists in the 18th century, including the very famous Ebenezer Sidley and his very famous associate, Francis Barrett, author of the incredibly influential 1801 The Magus. Though it's not until the rise of organized ritual occultism in the 19th century that the Lesser Key of Solomon will become the true canonical document of black magic. To cover that important period, from Mathers and Crowley all the way to contemporary ritual practitioners, I want to turn things over to my colleague Angela Puka over at Angela's Symposium. Make sure to check out her channel as she traces out this important history. This episode is part of a series here on Esoterica focusing on the history and development of magic. If you're interested in magic, or the occult, alchemy, theosophy, Kabbalah, make sure to subscribe and consider supporting Esoterica on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.